Well, we're, I'm here, Richard Schechner, editor of TDR with Rachel Chapkin, the well-known theater director. Currently, her Hades Town is on Broadway, and we're having a conversation. So, yeah. <laughs> so, hello. And I, I want to start with something you wrote a while ago, um, well, not that long. You called for a secretary of culture, something to that effect in the United States. Uh, the whole group of people, you wrote it. I think I signed it, but I didn't write yeah. it. So could you really explain what you meant and why you think that would be a great idea for the US? I mean, we already have a national endowment for the arts. So how would this be different from or substitute from or, or whatever? What, what did you have in mind? Yeah, um, uh, well, first I wanna say that I co-authored that letter with an incredible um, colleague named Jenny Kuhn. And Jenny was actually a primary um, uh, agitator, uh, which she is extremely good at, amongst many other things, um, uh, uh, of us thinking about this letter. And the call, which we were by no means the first people to be issuing this call, Be an Arts Hero had certainly raised it, um, as had others. Um, but as we were thinking about it, uh, there were multiple fronts um, and equity was certainly one of them um, in terms of uh, coming to the National Endowment for the Arts. You know, historically, there's been a lot of inequity in how the NEA has um, has provided funding for uh, arts organizations across the country, including just a lot of barriers to entry, um, such as requiring a 501c3 versus individual artists being able to get monies, um, uh, uh, the prohibitions that that might place on smaller grassroots organizations, which might not have an official uh, nonprofit status, uh, as well as just the amount, uh, the extensive um, length of an NEA application. Um, so the NEA is, a, and its reporting process as well, the NEA is a, obviously an incredibly vital um, granting organization um, uh, and we are by no means imagining that it would, you know, not be a part of a healthy ecosystem. But it felt really clear that, in particular, individual artists were incredibly um, uh, uh, sidelined or left out of a lot of the recovery funding. And and uh, you know, counter to that, the arts and culture make up. Uh, uh, many, many, many times over um, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of industry in this country. And so the idea that we wouldn't have a seat at the table to think about just how recovery funding um, was and is getting operated and funneled through the system to reach those it needs to get to the most um, was just uh, just clearly made no sense. Um, we are a bigger or in industry than several of the industries, including transportation and agriculture, that are that have secretaries and seats at the table. So we really needed to be in that room in a way that the NEA was never um, founded or created to be. That's just not a part of the NEA's charter. So the Secretary of Culture, if that's what uh, the, the job is called, would, uh, would would do what exactly? In other words, would it replace the NEA? I mean, would the NEA get absorbed into that cabinet level position? How, how would it work? And one thing before that, the uh, limitation on individual uh, uh, grants, as you probably know, started with the so-called NEA-4. Of course, yeah. 40 years ago, however long. Yeah. And they did it clearly overtly as a way of censoring. In other words, that Absolutely. Was, they didn't like those four artists, Karen Finley, uh, uh, you know, the, the other three, and they wanted to control it. So they said, you have to go through an organization. That was a terrible decision, I think. But your uh, proposal would undo that. And, and, and how, how, how would it work, do you think, Rachel? Yeah, I mean, uh, this was a, a, a huge and ongoing conversation that we had with a lot of people, both who had worked under Obama's administration and are part of the Biden administration. Um, and there were many different opinions uh, to get into very much the wonky weeds about whether um, uh, an economic advisor coming from uh, a, 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 someone at the economic advisor's desk with a focus on arts and culture, whether that would be actually much more effective than a, than a secretary or a separate department. Um, but fundamentally, as we thought about it, 
this person would be tasked with the coordination of uh, uh, arts and culture policy on a national level. So being able to look particularly at those states that are leaders, I mean, California's um, uh, investment in its arts and culture industry coming out of this pandemic uh, and actually even earlier at the height of the pandemic. Sorry, that's my baby in the yeah. background. Um, who's uh, getting, getting used to nap time. Um, uh, uh, but, um, yeah, so California has been this incredible leader and now New York, I think very inspired by California has helped make a huge number of investments in, uh, both, uh, nonprofits in those states, but also very much creating pipelines that had never existed before to artists, particularly artists working in low-income communities and communities of color, artists who are working at the intersection of wellness and culture, um, uh, of health and arts practice, uh, as well as as well as just community building and community re-engagement. Um, yeah, all, all of that so would have, be under the purview of this person. Has your letter gotten any legs? Has there any been any anything follow up on it? Has, has anybody in the Biden administration or anywhere taken? We had a, a number of really great conversations. Of course, the reality is just that there there are there's a major deep list of uh, things, including the infrastructure package and arts funding. I think quite smartly, there's a lot of um, visions for how artists can be a part of rebuilding efforts that have gotten built into recovery funding. So it's not necessarily right now its own distinct uh, cabinet position. And again, there were from a lot of different really smart strategists, a lot of different um, impulses about whether it makes sense to silo the culture and arts uh, funding streams, or whether actually the lifeblood is going to be about um, making it uh, disentangleable from other recoveries. So for example, I've been um, a thought partner on a big project that's a, a, a multi-city arts project, but that is working very closely with the National League of Cities and right. is actually looking at municipal funding that then can be allocated towards local artists and practitioners working in concert with municipalities and actually health centers um, is, is, a, is a dream. So that's, that's a project. Uh, yeah, that is still an incubation phase. So um, I want to put yeah. a different hat on you now as director. Yeah. So I want to talk. Uh, uh, because we have a, a limited time. So sure. how has it been to reopen on Broadway? I mean, what what's it feel pre-Zoom? I mean, I saw Hades Town, I don't know how many months, not so many months before it closed down. And now it, I think, was the first show to reopen. And first musical to reopen. The first, first show to reopen was Antoinette Nwandu's Passover. Oh, Passover, yes. I, I want to see that. I haven't seen it. Yeah. But anyway, what has it been like to get back uh, in in business, look at how have the audience has been. Can you give a kind of a, a brief a prior to the Zoom shutdown and now? Is it any different? Is it just a resumption, or is there some different feeling in the house and the in in on stage among your performers, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, um, I mean the the happy reality is we were really cooking with gas right up until the the day of the pandemic. You know, we'd basically been sold out for almost a year. We were just approaching our, our one year anniversary, um, which is a really meaningful milestone on Broadway. And um, and I'm I'm touch wood quite happy to say that we have actually reopened to significant strength. Um, every I haven't been at the show, of course, every night. Um, but every performance I've seen was was packed, was uh, was, I believe, sold out or near close to. I don't have, um, uh, you know, we're not seeing wraps quite in the same way right now, which I think is a wise move on the part of, of Broadway producers. But let, let's um, say if you were if you were a visitor from Mars and you saw it right before it shut down and you yeah. came right after it opened and you had no idea there was anything in between. 
would you notice anything different or is it just you wouldn't other than you would uh, you would say Patrick Page is not playing Hades right now right. and you right. might learn Patrick is off making a movie and so we have an incredible artist Tom Hewitt um, okay. who is playing the role of Hades and one of our fates um, is uh, on maternity leave and so we right. have a fantastic maternity cover but other than that the show is exactly the same and uh We've definitely had some incredibly um, <laughs> over the top audiences and a lot of people who shout welcome home at the top of the show. Yeah, oh, and that's, home, though, that's a good one. quite lovely. Actually, when you're thinking of it, Hades. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So another question, I realize we, we're always pressed for time in this short one. I, I wanted a longer time, but uh, uh, what, what, what project are you working on? Uh, two, two questions. They may be uh, linked. What projects are you working on now or towards the future? And what's the relationship between your work with team and your work in the, let's say, Broadway or commercial theater? Because they're quite different worlds. Uh, or are they different worlds anymore? So those two questions are related. Yeah, well, so I'll start actually with um, probably one of the biggest things I'm working on right now is a piece called Reconstruction, still working, but the devil might be inside, right. um, which is a new show that the team has been making since March of 2018. And this is a work that is about uh, race and intimacy and intimacy specifically um within the context of a violently anti-Black United States, right. um, both in the past and in our present. Um, An intimacy certainly between white identifying folks or those who have come to be known as white, as our um, process chaplain Milta would say, uh, and uh, Black folks and folks of color, um, but also very much intimacy um, uh, between Black communities, just between white communities, between communities of color, and even self-intimacy and the questions of, of what is involved, what, what is intimacy uh, as we think about it, um, understanding everything that is at work in a right. given interaction or shared moment. Um, so that is, we're about to head to Alabama, uh, to Montgomery, Alabama for okay. three weeks three week residency at Alabama State. That's where they have the lynching museum, right? Is that- the That's correct. So the Brian Stevenson's Equal Justice Initiatives um, uh, Memorial is there oh. and we'll actually be getting to spend quite a bit of time there as well as having a ton of different, we'll be working with the Southern Foodways Alliance right. and a number of other partners that Alabama Shakes ASF has um, been able to connect us with. So we're incredibly excited about that residency. People who might not know American history intimately, Montgomery was the bus boycott. It was really the beginning of the uh, new wave, or uh, the Martin Luther King, let's put it, wave, uh, the Rosa Parks wave of uh, Black activism. So Montgomery is a very important uh, uh, historical marker for that. Is that why you chose Montgomery, or was there another reason why Montgomery? Uh, no, I mean, certainly Montgomery's uh, a unique role in um, the mid 20th century civil rights movement and its ongoing legacy. I mean, that's that's part of why the National Memorial, National Lynching Memorial is there. Um, absolutely was part of our thinking. And we ended up having a wonderful encounter with Rick Dildine, who is the um, artistic director, the new artistic director of Alabama Shakes. And so this opportunity and alliance of what Rick is trying to do at ASF and what the team is interested in just felt really, really clear and vibrant. Um, so that's one you, thing. Oh, yes. Go ahead, please. No, no. I mean, I, can, uh, to, uh, I guess I'll leap off of that to the second part of your question, which was like, what are the overlaps between the team yes. and... Right. Yeah. I mean, there's obviously there there's always calendar competitions. Um, but actually, I think what's what's become very crystallized for me over the last number of years, when I was a much earlier career artist beginning to do freelance work, I think I, I, I thought, oh, the team will be where I do my work and then and then I'll do 
you know, these other things, whether commercial or just nonprofit mainstream, um, that will be other people's work. And actually, in many ways, it's kind of reversed in the sense of my freelance work. I am really free to pursue whatever I, whatever projects I want, however I want. Um, and it's, it's much more relaxing, right. To have a hierarchy. <laughs> the team for those who don't know is um, very dedicated to non-hierarchical practice and a horizontal consensus driven writing process and editing process. Um, and so what I have come to discover is the team is really the place where I, in deep, deep, an ongoing conversation with others, get to most rigorously exercise and grow and deepen my politics and, and putting those politics into practice. And that is challenged and heightened uh, every day the team is working. So there's, n I mean, we are family, but it's, it's not exactly a it's not a relaxing process in the way that doing the Hades town tour, you know, is right. There's a lot involved, but it's very, it feels very chill because there's not constant existential questioning of what are we doing here and why are we here and how are we working? But it is, a, the team is a forum to ask all those questions. And that is incredibly rejuvenating and, um, uh, educational, you know, it's just like a constant place for a lab. Who are the key members of the team now? Are they the same as when you formed, you formed it uh, more than 10 years ago? I mean, it's, it's oh, it's, it was formed in 2004. So uh, almost we're, almost we're not far from 20 yeah. and no, it's not that, I mean, yes, many of, uh, pretty, um, um, mo many of the founders are still very much working with the company. Um, are and are a part of reconstruction. Um, but also there's a lot of, um, there's a huge amount of new members of the collective. And I would say, actually, I, I just use the word members out of habit, but we're, we're trying to get away from the idea of membership or company as, uh, as well, Jillian Walker. How, how many, what? how many people are involved in reconstruction? I think there's about 25. Right. Um, and as one of them, Jillian Walker, who uh, is a core member of the collective and writer and maker of Reconstruction at this point, um, she said, membership makes me think of Costco. So <laughs> we're really trying to get away from actually, <laughs> you know, the, the, the white supremacist roots right. of this idea of like an exclusionary right. approach to membership, which ultimately felt terrible to us, particularly, especially because all of the founding members had been white identifying artists. And right. uh, that felt so, you know, we just were no longer interested in that harm and the kind of ignorance that had led us to found that collective in the first place. Now it's a multicultural, multiracial uh, uh, structure, uh, leadership, or has it changed? Well, so uh, t uh, it's a, there's a tension, right? I am still the artistic director right. and I'm a white woman. And our producing director, Ali Lalonde, um, is also a white woman. And that's our one full-time staff position. Right. Um, uh, so right now on a kind of day-to-day -day level um, and producerial level, the leadership is still white. Um, though we are bringing on um, another, we have one associate producer who is a white woman and we are bringing on another associate producer um, who is a, a woman of color. Um, right. So, uh, so there's, and then on the artistic front, absolutely, the leadership is incredibly, um, uh, certainly uh, racially diverse uh, people of color with, a, I think, a particular emphasis on Black artists right. um, in terms of just like population makeup. Um, but yes, that is, there's both. Do you have any timetable for reconstruction and where it might be after it in, in Montgomery, where it might be seen by people? Or? Yeah, so um, likely we think fall of 22, you know, co we were supposed to be doing this Alabama residency in June of 2020. Right. So that has certainly really thrown things for a loop. Um, uh, 
Uh, but we think fall of 2022, and we have a lot of different partners we've been talking. Um, I think it's okay to say with the Brooklyn Academy of Music about it um, and New York, um, but also um, OSF has been a, a developmental partner. Um, uh, uh, Carolina Performing Arts in OSF um, is Opera Chapel Center. Hill. Oh, Sorry, OSF. what? OSF is what? is Oregon Shakespeare Festival Oregon um, in Ashland. Okay. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, there will be, we expect that Reconstruction will have, the Broad Stage is one of our commissioners as well, which is in Santa Monica. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of partners on the, on the work. And it, it particularly also, I should say, the Roundhouse, uh, in oh. D, right outside of D.C. Right. And any, any new, uh, Broadway productions online? Uh, yeah, and- so I am very, very deep many years now into development of a massive musical that breaks my heart every time I listen to it called Lempica. That is about the painter Tamara de Lempica. Oh. And that is going to be um, at La Jolla Playhouse, which we were supposed to be at in spring of 2020 um uh that will be there uh and is you know hopefully the anticipation is on a broadway trajectory yeah oh terrific now here's this is out of left field but are you going to make a movie i mean uh often people you know you start people decide well i can do movie or you know or 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 amazon you know one of the uh one of the streaming uh so there must be opportunities coming to you. Yes, I am. I actually just got back from a site visit, a location scout for a film that we will see may or may not uh, move forward this particular one, but there's a lot of optimism around it. And I've also spent the pandemic um, uh, digging into a couple different film and television projects, actually, that I've long been dreaming about, but hadn't hadn't had the opportunity or the time uh, or bandwidth pre-pandemic to work on. So, so those are moving forward as well. Great. And how do you, uh, or, or how easy or difficult is it to balance it with being a, a reasonably new mother? Yeah, is- so I have a three-month-old who, um, as I indicated, is sleep training right now. Right. And um, uh, I would say I got I got to essentially like, um, have this strange test drive uh, by being the mommy of a baby for two of my best friends back right, in 2019 right, right. and got to spend so much of the pandemic having this incredibly, you know, beautiful, concentrated time with them, um, uh, which I, I felt very much like a cosmic winner in a, in a terrible tragedy around the, well, around the globe. Um, uh, and now that was very clarifying for me about w- <laughs> how I want to try to be scheduling myself in life. Um, so I would say still it's a daily um, annoyance sometimes when I have like five meetings that crop up. Um, but, uh, uh, but I'm trying to be rigorous about prioritizing Sam um, and, uh, and considering that part of my job. And also, I am fundamentally incredibly privileged because of the success of Hades Town to be in a position where I can um, afford help. And so, actually, we are very lucky. Um, my husband's sister, who uh, we're both incredibly close with, Elizabeth, she has just moved to New York from Iowa and oh. she is um, Sam's nanny. So that's another kind of level of privilege, which is to be able to have family available uh, and interested in being a part of our lives. Um, so so he's often with his, as she calls it, not nanti. <laughs> right. I wish we could go on. We've run out of time. It's always great talking to you. And, it's uh, wonderful these, to see you, Richard. One of these years, we'll go face to face. and uh, That sounds fantastic. Share a, share a meal or a drink or something. And good luck with everything from Sam to your video work, to the Montgomery work, to the Broadway work, to the teamwork, everything. You're really, I, I cite you often to younger people as a, as a, a, a great model of uh, what a life in art 
you know, I think of Stanislavski's book and you uh, actually live it. So it's, oh, thanks, it's Richard. So much. Thank you. It's so wonderful much. to see you. Wonderful to see you too. Have a great day. And uh, Cambridge, we are signing off. <laughs>